Hi all. Magnus Carlsen had to play Anish Giri for the Tata Steel tiebreak system to decide the winner of this edition of the Tata Steel. Let's see a key game from that tiebreak. So this is one of the two games they played. Magnus Carlsen playing white played knight f3, so the Reti opening. Knight f6 was played. c4, so English opening, e6. And now b3. Because the pawn is on the light square, you could argue that black has slightly weakened the dark squares. And this is quite logical to Fianchetto the bishop to either dark squares. A little bit like playing uh, the Nimzo Larsen uh, system with knight f3 and b3, except c4 has been played as well. d5, bishop b2, bishop e7, and e3. So these are very dark square gripping moves. e3 with this configuration. The focus is on these key dark squares here. Black castled, knight c3. C5, which does give the idea that black would like to play d4. Now Magnus took on d5 here, and after knight takes d5, there is uh, a couple of major moves here. Magnus chose knight takes d5. There's also queen c2, which I believe Magnus has played before. And for example, this has been seen quite a bit with an equal, even position. Uh, but in this game, we have knight takes d5, e takes. And again, d4 might be a concern for uh, for white because tactically it could be quite useful. For example, bishop uh, e2. Let's look at bishop e2 instead of what was played, which was d4. So look, let's look at bishop e2, d4. If ed here, there's bishop f6. And that's quite nasty. Black would be getting a, a nice bind on the position with a space advantage. If black were to take that on knight c6 later, that would be at least equal. So the way Magnus plays this is actually to allow uh, the potential for being checked with the king in the center. And in fact, this happens now, queen a5 check. So we have simplification, queen d2, queen takes d2, king takes d2. So was white strategy uh, worth it here? He has got a good grip still on the dark squares. After knight c6, Magnus isolates the queen's pawn here with d takes, capturing away from the center, opening up the bishop. Has black got enough compensation for that isolated queen's pawn? Bishop b5. We have bishop b4 check. The king goes to e2. Bishop e6. Rook a c1. There's pressure on the black position. Rook a c8. Rook h d1. White has a very comfortable position though. Is it enough? to gain a significant advantage. So the bishop drops back. h3, a6, and now this bishop drops back. Knight b4, attacking the pawn as well as the bishop. The bishop drops back to protect a2. A couple of rooks come off. Rook c8. Not mega exciting, but very, very high state game this to decide <laughs> the winner of Tatar still. So bear with it for a moment. Rook d1. Now we have knight c6, g4, and this gives the idea potentially, as well as stopping black from playing a clamping move like h5 or f5 to stop g4, it also means perhaps that once the knight moves, f4, f5 could be useful, gaining space. h6, knight d4, that iron grip on the, on the dark squares is demonstrated here. Knight takes d4, bishop takes d4. Bishop a3, which gives the idea that black might want to try and exchange another rook off. After f4, perhaps black could have tried this rook c1, but instead played f6, which seems harmless enough in some respects. But are these light squares going to backfire on black later? These compromised light squares a little bit. White immediately goes into g6 here after king f8, king f3. King e7, h4, bishop b4, bishop drops back, bishop d7. Is white making progress? Black's about to perhaps do bishop c6 to discourage e4 here. This is an interesting decision point now. Isolated queen spawn, but it's not exactly the most exploitable weakness in the world. Weaknesses are not necessarily 
weaknesses in the practical sense if there's no contextual ways of actually exploiting it and here in fact make this trades it off the ice state queen's pawn to improve this bishop basically uh bishop c3 is first played though instead of d takes so bishop c3 that bishop drops back and now instead of taking it which would centralize white's bishop for free and attack b7 bishop c6 e takes bishop takes bishop e4 Will, will White, will Magnus Carlsen be left with any advantage whatsoever here? Well, after Bishop takes e4, King takes e4, we can see that this King could glide into the light squares up to g6 potentially. And in fact, maybe King f5 is an immediate threat. It seems to be parried with King e6. f5 check is a complementary Bishop to the pawns on light squares here. King e7. Rook c1 with the immediate threat of Bishop d4. So this is parried with rook c6, protecting that rook, so bishop d4 can be handled. King d3, bishop b4, and there is a compromise to black's position here. After rook takes c6, you see that the pawns are shattered, they're isolated. Is this uh, a winning end game for white? Let's see, king c4, bishop d6, bishop c5, king d7. Now the, the king and pawn ending Magnus didn't actually swap into the king and pawn ending here, uh, but he has got a plan potentially of harassing the a6 pawn at some point with a king maneuver to a5. So bear that in mind. He locks down the king side with h5 and invites black to take on c5. And this could be a case of a fatal zugzwang position if black does take on c5. Black didn't uh, risk that. He could be faced with running out of moves. White's got some spare moves there. Uh, just as a little example, if we have this position, White needs either King B6 or D6. And say B4, where does Black go? The, with the locking down, it's going to be Zugswang. So Black keeps the bishop on, but it seems to invite Bishop F8. Tactically, this is not working now to take this pawn after this next move by black, king e8. Or rather, it's only good enough for a draw to take on g7. Magnus actually retreated the bishop back, still with an idea potentially of king b4 to a5. If uh, bishop takes g7, computers say this kind of position, where, where white sacks the bishop and gets this c6 pawn, is just equal actually. It's apparently equal. Uh, so let's not go into that. So bishop c5, the bishop retracts. Bishop c5 for a moment. King d7. King b4 with the intention king a5. Check. King a4. Now this bridge can be crossed still with b4 to break that connection of the, the bishop to a5. And we have now b4. So king a5 is now on the cards. The problem is the king's overloaded. Although the king can stop a6 from being taken. Bishop f8 with a vengeance, and the bishop's not going to be so easily trapped, is, is coming up. Bishop f4, bishop f8 here now. King b6, just letting a pawn go. Bishop g5, bishop f8, so white's a clear pawn up. Bishop f4, bishop e7, black's on the defensive. The king comes back to the center a bit. Bishop c5, king c7. And now Magnus finds the winning plan, king d3, just to exchange off this bishop with bishop e3, will mean that there's going to be a passed pawn decisive breakthrough with the three to two on this side. After king d7, bishop e3, black resigned. Black will be in Zugzwang in this scenario. If black allows to take, then white will have a passed pawn. But say black took, then black is going to be in a difficult position soon. Uh, for example, like this, there's going to be a, a winning breakthrough at some point, or just Zugzwang, in fact, maybe easier uh, with a4. It would still be a Zugzwang type position, king either going to b6 or d6. So it wasn't played on actually after bishop e3. But remember, it's just a blitz game, but it's a very high profile blitz game indeed. So Magnus won this first blitz game. So Let's see what would happen in the second game.
if you don't already know I'll do a video soon for that I hope you got something out of this video uh, comments questions like shares appreciated thanks so much